Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. This is a, a great group and uh, we're really excited about this conversation today. My name is Nicole Golden. I am the director of the Youth Prosperity and Security Initiative here at CSIS, which is run in partnership with the International Youth Foundation. We launched this initiative in January. And this is a really important conversation as part of our public event series that we've been running. I want to read this quote from Secretary Clinton from uh, a speech he gave in Tunisia uh, last year. There are underlying dynamics that are affecting young people everywhere. Changes in demographics and technology, economics and politics, that are bringing together this unique moment in history. Young people are at the heart of today's great strategic opportunities and challenges, from rebuilding the global economy to combating violent extremism and to building sustainable democracies. So we at CSIS firmly believe that these trends continue to be true and that we think that there are tremendous opportunities in young people to explore which is why we launched this initiative to really explore these near and long-term geopolitical, economic, societal trends of young people and really see young people as central to global development outcomes as well as to the landscape of global prosperity and security. So a critical part of that conversation, especially given some of the global conversations around development policy, uh, the post-2015 development agenda, I'm sure we'll get to, um, and a number of other um, major sort of economic look forwards, look aheads, is to understand and to talk about how the US government is thinking about and incorporating young people into its approach to development, to diplomacy, and thinking about our national security efforts. So we are delighted to have with us today, I'm very delighted to have, uh, dare I say, a very youthful panel uh, with me to discuss these issues. Um, friends and colleagues that I, I know of have really been leaders in championing these issues um, in their respective agencies, and so we're really lucky to have them with us today. Um, we have Andrew Cedar, Senior Director for Global Engagement at the National Security Staff at the White House, Zinat Rahman, who is the Secretary Special Advisor for Global Youth Issues and directs the Office of Global Youth Issues at the Department of State, and of course, Stephen Feldstein, who is the Director of Policy at the U.S. Agency for International Development. So I'd like to just, again, welcome you all here today. We're gonna to start by asking each of them to say um, a few words and give us an overview of where their agencies are in terms of thinking about and, uh, youth issues and addressing youth, and then we'll engage in a conversation, and then we'll open it up to all of you. And I also just wanna say, um, again, welcome to you all and also to our um, audience online. So, Andrew, over to you. Thanks, Nicole, and thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm gonna keep this very brief so we can open this up to a conversation, but just wanted to, to start the panel off with a little bit of a broad, global view of how the administration sees this, why it has become increasingly central, sort of both before and after a number of, of global events that have happened over the last number of years, which I think has brought this to the fore, but really the way we were thinking about it, actually before a number of these events, um, and how that's playing out across diplomacy, development, uh, and defense, and then we can talk in greater detail, Zinat and Steve can, can delve in a bit more to what we're doing at aid and state at a more programmatic level. Um, first of all, I think you see this is a huge issue and it has been from the beginning. This is something that's in the president's DNA, not necessarily exclusively because of global events, but if you look at the way he became president, it's a pretty unexpected event, very much uh, happened because of young people, because of their optimism, enthusiasm, and energy, and quite frankly, it's not just those things. Those are have been around for young, with young people for a very long time, but actually their capacity, their, the resources at their disposal and the ability to actually organize and make things happen. So he came into office knowing full well that networks of citizens, and particularly young people, uh, had the ability to shape global events and not just kind of youth events, but, but real global politics and, and social norms. Um, you look more globally when the president came into office, some of these things seem incredibly obvious now, but they weren't at the time. Um, certainly the demographic 
changes that, that are happening. And again, th these things don't happen overnight. You, you can see demographic bulges coming for a long time, but they begin to hit at a certain point. And that's obviously one piece of this, the fact that, and we all debate what the statistics are, but 60 plus percent of people under the age of 30, 35, you choose your statistic. But whatever your statistic, those are pretty striking numbers. And at a certain point, and I would challenge those in this room to think about this too, that doesn't become youth policy, that just becomes people policy, right? When you're talking about 60 plus percent of the population, um, and especially in a number of the places where our foreign policy cha challenges are most acute, those numbers are even higher. So first, there's this demographic piece. Second, obviously, people know this, uh, the communications revolution that's happened around the world. The ability of people to connect, to shape uh, stories far from where they live is something that's fundamentally changed global affairs. It's fundamentally changed the ability of people to influence our interests, whether it comes from radicalization from across the world, whether it comes from economic uh, opportunity and business creation. These are things now where people can connect and collaborate uh, much more easily than they could before. And lastly, probably as a, as a consequence of those first two, we've seen uh, huge changes over the last 20 years in political systems around the world. And so obviously, if you take a slightly longer lens on this, uh, the number of democracies um, writ large has, has certainly proliferated. And even in those countries that aren't democracies, I think we see the role of public opinion and therefore youth opinion, since quite frankly, they're often very vocal often constitute the majorities of populations uh, as something that's critical, that's shaping internal social and political dynamics in countries around the world. And these are things that really used to be the province of, of elites in societies. And for that matter, hard security experts within governments and those sorts of questions, this is now a question that has spilled over dramatically into our defense policy, our national security policy as well. Um, but all three of those forces, I don't think, tell the full story about why this has come to the fore, because <clears throat> certainly demographic changes have happened before. Demographic youth bulges have happened before, certainly in isolated geographies. Um, I think what, what you've seen now that's really fascinating is for a long time there was a really big gap between the energy and enthusiasm of young people and even per perhaps their numbers and their ability to actually do anything about it. So, you know, there was sort of a mentality of you wait your turn. Well, the truth is now the waiting is, is a little bit shorter than it used to be. Uh, and part of the reason for that is it used to be really expensive to shape people's opinions globally. You needed radio transmitters. You needed the institutions of the state or state broadcaster or some private broadcasting entity uh, to start businesses, often particularly in the manufacturing world. You needed huge capital costs. You needed the ability to start a factory, get iron ore, all of this stuff. We now live in a world where a uh, combination of certainly on the broadcasting side, probably most of you right now are broadcasting anyway, and your reach is just as much as CNN or anyone else. Anyone in the world can get it. It's a huge difference. And again, it closes that gap between kind of idealism and, and ideas of youth and their capacity to actually do something about it. Similarly, on the economic side, you look at billion dollar companies right now. Certainly there are some that you still need some pretty expensive inputs, but there are many that are reshaping the way commerce is done the way people transact online with very, very little in the way of startup costs. And so you have this closing gap between the aspirations of youth and their ability to do something about it. Um, you compound that though with the, with the changing nature of the international system in that the issues that we're facing as a country, as a government, are issues that you can't necessarily put two diplomats in a room, work out a treaty and call it quits and move on to the next thing. And so actually getting out and engaging with young people is a huge priority for us because the ability of, of public opinion to move these issues, the ability, quite frankly, to sway a young person somewhere in the world, to give them opportunity uh, that they can realize their aspirations rather than be frustrated without a job uh, or an education that they don't know how to apply. Um, so these things are, are now front and center. The other thing that I will say is uh, this fits very much into the president's vision because he's inherently someone who has tried time and time again to really look towards the future. And it's on the basis of that that he was elected. It's on the basis of that that if you look around the world, uh, wherever he goes, I mean, I just thought about the last couple months, he was in Mexico and spoke to a youth audience. He was in Israel and spoke to a youth audience. He was in Northern Ireland and spoke to a youth audience. Uh, he's gonna be in Africa starting in a couple hours and this Saturday will host another uh, youth-focused event. And for him, this is a way to 
begin talking to the people who are really going to shape the future, who are important stakeholders 20 years from now, but also are important shapers right now. And so on the Africa front, the president's going now. A great example of this is his desire in 2010 when a number of African countries were undergoing uh, their 50th anniversaries of independence, rather than calling a head of state summit, rather than reaching out to lots of guys who had been in power for sometimes almost even 50 years, he decided to invite 120 young people who were changing the continent to the White House for a direct dialogue. And again, I think that speaks very much to his approach to these issues, which is, you know, young people are not the people who we talk to or about and say, oh, well, one day you guys will shape this and, oh, one day you'll inherit this, but right now they're shaping things. And so I think that really, uh, that really is encompassed by the president's approach to these issues. I think he very much recognizes that when you look ac across diplomacy, development, defense, and we'll hear in more detail, um, that you can't make progress on these issues without 60% of the world. Um, and so youth are, are certainly baked into what we do, but I also think we're trying to take a broader perspective now, which isn't just how do we think about youth as youth, but more how do we think about youth as critical stakeholders in the issues that most impact us. And so continuing to hive it off in, the, in its own world actually, I think, sometimes does a disservice to it. And so thinking about it holistically is another piece of this. And so when the president goes places and talks to young people, people always ask, well, how come you're talking to young people? Isn't that kind of weird? And why, is that, why would you do that? And, and isn't that not really what's important? I think for us, it's a holistic part about how you advance your mission around the world. And you'll see it again this week. You'll see it as the president continues to talk about these issues, whether they're honestly domestic or foreign. I think you saw yesterday he decided to go to Georgetown to do uh, the climate change speech, again, because he sees young people as critical stakeholders, not just in the inheriting of a world, but as people who can really move public opinion, uh, corporate action for that matter, uh, in ways that really matter. So it's, a, it's an issue we think about quite a bit. It's an issue that's at the forefront of our minds across, again, those three areas of national security and uh, looking forward to a good conversation about this. Thanks, Andrew. Just to add um, quickly a, a comment and some color on, on the technology piece, I, I just find this interesting statistic. There was a recent a survey that was done by the Financial Times with uh, Telefonica uh, company, and they surveyed 12,000 millennials 18 to age 18 to 30 in 27 countries um, across six inhabited continents, if you will. Um, and just very quickly, you know, 87% said that technology has made language barriers easier to overcome. Another 70% said technology creates more opportunities for all. Um, and 83% said that technology has made it easier to get a job. So just, uh, just to sort of add a little color on that technology point, which I think is so crucial, and we'll probably come back to that and, and some of the other uh, points you raised. Zenat, please. Thanks, Nicole. It's a pleasure to be in an audience at a think tank in DC that's mostly young people. That doesn't happen that often. So I'm really happy to be here with you guys today. Um, you know, I think maybe to put a little bit of a finer point on some of what Andrew was saying about um, how we view young people and that, you know, it's not, I, I think what it may have been before is, you know, a constituency that was impacted by our programs or our policies. And I think increasingly there's a recognition um, that young men and women around the world represent a vital constituency whose potential remains untapped or undertapped in the pursuit of advancing our strategic interests, our U.S. strategic interests abroad. Um, I think part of that recognition is obviously the leadership of the president, and that's why an office like this was created, which is you know an office that's only a couple of years old in a position that's only a couple of years old. Um, you know, as we look at the external reality, we realize that, you know, as we move our policies from young people as passive, you know, parts of the population to key actors who we have to figure out how to engage, um, that they represent a new center of power and influence, as Andrew said, that, um, that are the current key actors in critical global issues. So whether we're looking at the protests in Brazil or Turkey, the stuff that happened in India in December, of course, the Arab Spring um, protests that happened in the Middle East, that young people are the, you know, making up the vast majority of people who are leading those and obviously are parts of those because of the demographic um, reality, but really, you know, are the ones who are turning kind of that key to unleash that 
enthusiasm, energy, excitement, the online piece into an offline dimension. Um, and so, you know, looking at this cohort or this generation of young people, just a couple of reflections. One is that this is the biggest youth cohort that has ever existed. And this may also be the first time that young people think of themselves as a global cohort, not as you know individually living in their local space, but actually as connected to um, a bigger story. And I, I'm guessing that most of you feel that way too, probably, um, that you have a global consciousness. That many people around the world, many young people around the world, are growing up for the, in the middle class for the first time in their families, and that obviously human health and well-being have had many advances, and people are, you know, living longer than they have before. Um, and then I think this part about technology, that as digital natives, that young people are the most savvy creators and consumers of technology and its products. So again, how does that online piece kind of, you know, how has this triggered the all of the offline activity or the real world activity that we said or that we see? And that, you know, I think um, unlike previous generations, young people are navigating a world that is in a constant state of change. Um, and they're more aware of this change because of the greater access to information. And so whereas, you know, the de definition of success or a successful livelihood in a previous generation may have been, you know, the same job for 20 years, a good retirement, you know, it, it may have meant things that just are not the reality for young people today. And so, you know, all of our foreign policy priorities, if you look at, you know, the Secretary's push around the Middle East peace process, the President going to Africa, and, you know, of his three priorities, engaging youth is one of his core priorities of, of this trip of his. Um, you know, I think are part of a realization that young people have a direct influence or, an inf or have an influencing role in us being able to move and shape our policies. And so, we are advancing a strategy that institutionalizes our ability to engage this cohort as a set of actors in our foreign policy landscape. And that's new for the State Department, um, looking at things that are beyond, you know, diplomat to diplomat engagement. So some of the ways that, and I'm going to speak broadly about the ways we're doing that, but kind of happy to d dive deeper into the programmatic ways um, during the Q&A. But we really tried to focus on building the institutional capacity of our diplomatic core to create strategies around engagement. So that means our officers in the field, that's going to the Foreign Service Institute and, you know, doing trainings around youth plus, you know, name any cross-cutting issue because youth cross-cut all of them. You know, we've tried to institutionalize frameworks for youth engagement through youth councils. We have 66 around the world through our embassies where we are looking for feedback and, you know, opinions from young change makers. Um, and we so so that's one strategy is just looking at our diplomatic core and how do we improve our engagement there. Another piece of this is establishing a multi-stakeholder approach to addressing the key challenges that young people face. And so, there are not youth policies for policy's sake, but young people are disproportionately affected by some of the major you know issues in the world, particularly the one about around economic opportunity. And so I think the one constant in the travel that I do is the, the lack of economic opportunity that exists for young people wherever I go. And so a multi-stakeholder <clears throat> approach to us means the public sector. It means you know us, foreign governments, multilaterals, private sector, NGOs, and young people themselves. And then if you look at any one of these dimensions, you know, private sector, actors can't, they can't create all the jobs that are needed. Young people by themselves can't do it with, you know, the skills that they might try to get themselves. We as government can't do it alone. Um, but in order to, you know, actually move the needle on this, that it has to be this approach. So we've uh, looked at creating frameworks around, particularly around the lack of economic opportunity. And that we're looking at innovative um, approaches to partnership directly with young influencers. And so I think a great example of this is partnership through entrepreneurship. And this is something um, either of us can kind of speak more about during Q&A. Um, I've had the good, so today's my one year anniversary in this position, which I'm excited about. Um, but so I've had the good fortune to kind of travel and engage with some of our youth council members and do a lot of, you know, engagement with young people and engagement with my colleagues in the field. Um, and just some of the takeaways and the things that I hear, um, I want to just offer, which one is that, you know, the young people are looking at the U.S. to facilitate and convene um, different sets of actors around big issues, around economic growth and development, around democracy and governance, around 21st century statecraft. Um, and in many countries, 
we are the only ones that are convening them. We are the only ones that are bringing young influencers together to hear what they have to say. Um, you know, we, and so that's one point. Second point is that I hear a lot about the need for role models and for platforms. So role models that are indigenous, that are in, within their peer group, you know, that are tackling the same challenges that they are, and that they need platforms by which they can speak about the change that they are making um, in the communities that they're in. And then I think you know the third piece kind of brings it back to all of you, which is the American dimension in this. That as I said, you know, young people act as a global cohort. And I would say that millennials today from both sides deeply benefit from the engagement with their peers. And you know, we've helped facilitate those networks for change makers. And that I think there's there's an e there's an equalness to that relationship now, which is that you know young Americans meeting you know young Ugandans or you know, young Indians has, you know, a, a, a value proposition on both sides of the equation. Um, and so that's something that I know Secretary Kerry is particularly interested in, which is how do we pull in the assets that we have in the U.S.? And part of, I think, one of our biggest assets are you guys. So I'll stop there. Great. Well, thanks. I'm really happy to be part of this panel as well. Um, and uh, Nicole actually came from our office and where she spearheaded and led the creation of our first ever youth and development policy. So uh, it was a real pleasure to collaborate with her on that and, and come back here and uh, talk a little bit about the issues that she cared so passionately about from the USAID standpoint and now able to use uh, CSIS as a forum for that. Uh, so just a few points. Uh, I'll be talk a little bit about the development perspective when it comes to youth. And you know, while my overall portfolio and, and job responsibility extends beyond the youth issue, uh, to sort of broader policy issues facing the agency on development. Uh, you know, I think the youth issues is particularly apt given how much I see cross-cutting links uh, and an important emphasis uh, on the youth issue as it relates to uh, a whole slew of things that we are, uh, are concerned with, whether we're talking about extreme poverty, whether we're thinking about broader development and national security issues, whether we're looking at climate change, food, feed the future, uh, global health, there is a, a common link that I think runs there and our ability to understand and, and, and harness and, and capture the youth issue in a more consistent way uh, is extremely important. You know, I think like many other agencies um, and policymakers uh, globally, you know, we're struggling as an agency to really understand better uh, how the, the evolving nature of, of different things in our world uh, what, what shape and form it's going to take. Uh, we certainly know it's more multipolar. Uh, it's both younger in some respects, and it's also aging very quickly uh, in other areas. And so that, that's a, a, a very difficult demographic challenge. Uh, you know, as several of the other, uh, Pat Zenod and Andrew mentioned, uh, the rise of the middle class is an issue that both brings a ton of potential, but also has ramifications in terms of displacement uh, and broader access to political participation issues. Uh, we have an, uh, a growing amount of individual empowerment, and I think that's been uh, really enhanced by uh, the role of technology uh, as well and a general diffusion of power. But again, that also leads to bigger issues when it comes to better understanding the role of the nation state vis-a-vis -vis other non-state actors and so forth. Uh, and then we also have the rise of urbanization of, of cities, different ways that we're organizing spatially, uh, which will really come, come to play a role. Um, you know, I'm really seized by the fact that you know, in, in the worldwide population today of about 7 billion, over 50% of the population is under 30, the vast majority of which live in the developing world, uh, and the vast majority of those countries in which USAID has a, has a presence. And so, you know, from that alone, it, it emphasizes pretty clearly to us that in order to have success in terms of achieving our primary development goals, we, we have to understand how those link to youth. Um, you know, I think there, there are a slew of issues that uh, I think we will need to take extremely seriously as we move forward from a developmental standpoint. Uh, there's the issue of a million youth uh, entering the wor workforce uh, each month in Sub-Saharan Africa and India. Uh, there's the, uh, the notion that unemployment for youth is three times higher than adults, and we have a, uh, around 75 million youth who are, are currently unemployed worldwide, uh, which, you know, is a very I think worrisome number. Uh, we also have issues like uh, youth ages 15 to 24 uh, represent 45% of new HIV 
cases and are also 33% less likely to be uh, part of the, f uh, the formal financial sector, including having a bank account. Uh, youth are unduly affected by violence, with 250,000 homicides uh, of youth taking place um, last year. Uh, but I also think that it's important to think about some of the mythologies that uh, surround youth when it comes to uh, developmental aspects. Uh, while, for example, 86% of countries in conflict have uh, populations that are less than, uh, less than 30, or majority of the population is less than 30, and while 14 of the 20 failed states, uh, at least as listed in the Foreign Policy's Failed States Index, uh, uh, have a median age of 19 years, you know, in of itself, that doesn't mean that there's a problem or an issue associated with, the, with youth. What it does mean, however, is that we are dealing with a broader spectrum of institutional failure uh, that's symptomatic uh, of problems when you don't have a cohesive society or a stable society or the right type of opportunities, thereby leading to and exacerbating uh, a cohort that doesn't feel that they have opportunities to otherwise engage economically, politically, or socially. Uh, so part of that is really trying to think about that in a more holistic way, to not pinpoint a group and say, there is a problem here, therefore we need to, to directly target solutions on, on a narrow aspect, but to think about more broadly, what does it mean in, in terms of mainstreaming and integration? What does it mean when we think about youth pop, uh, uh, populations being part of the development solution overall? Uh, so that's really part of the, the goal, you know, I, I think, is, is not only to focus uh, on specific programs and activities, but think about the integration and mainstreaming within our programming, and to also think about the transition from youth to adulthood uh, and, and think about youth as, as potential drivers of, of that change. Um, I also want to talk for a second about youth and extreme poverty agenda. So one of the things that has really energized the agency uh, since the State of the Union this year was the President's call for the eradication of extreme poverty over a generation. Uh, so that's, that's a huge task, a huge calling. We're starting to, to disaggregate and better understand how to think about it and approach it in conjunction with other partners. Uh, what we have uh, been able to determine is that really there's sort of two focal points in terms of that issue. Uh, the first is sort of looking at extreme poverty pockets in middle income countries, so places like India, Indonesia, China, uh, where there continues to be large populations that have been less affected by economic growth so far. Uh, the second uh, is a very large uh, cohort of fragile states. Uh, either fragile by governance, fragile in terms of general conflict, fragile in terms of just uh, uh, poor institutions. Uh, it, it, the, the former group, the middle income countries, is one that probably as an agency we have less that we can affect. Uh, and most likely, according to most projections, those are places that over the next generation should be able to bring the extreme poverty level down to a, to a pretty small degree. But it is the fragile states, uh, the places that we hear about in the news, the ones that are wracked by conflict, the ones that are slowly emerging uh, from civil war and so forth, the ones that also happen to have an extremely large youth population uh, that without pot uh, potentially productive employment or opportunities, it is, uh, it is those that we are most concerned about as an agency and it is those that we need to devise the right kind of strategies with our partners to understand uh, and tackle and to think uh, from our standpoint, for a second, that we'll be able to get at this issue without better understanding, incorporating, and being consistent about how we engage with youth uh, is a fallacy and, and won't get us to the overall goal. So as we think about this broader objective uh, you know, for, uh, for the government and, and globally uh, that the President has put out, uh, that the World Bank uh, President has reiterated as well, that is really a charge for us. Um, finally, just to talk uh, for a minute or so about how, on a more programmatic level, we're responding uh, to youth. So we, were, we came out and launched a policy in November. Um, uh, again, thanks to Nicole. We and her team, uh, we now have an acting youth coordinator, Marianne Yurks, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, uh, but it really is serving as our interim point person in terms of bringing together different efforts and really coming up with an action plan for figuring out how we institutionalize and carry forward and implement uh, some of the key elements, uh, whether it's strengthening youth programming, mainstreaming and integrating, and, or even thinking about the cross county nature of youth with some of the other policies uh, that have come out, whether on gender, whether on education, whether on resilience, uh, countering of violent extremism, so on or so forth. Um, you know, we 
need to do, we need to continue stock taking and understanding where we are when it comes to our youth programming. We need to establish a baseline, both uh, in terms of, of, of understanding where the, what the evidence is saying, and then also understanding how we can monitor and capture lessons learned from that. Uh, we also need to make sure that we support and strengthen youth engagement platforms uh, across the board. Finally, there's, I think, a big international component as well uh, that's a critical thing to keep in mind. Many of you probably know about the post-2015 Millennium Development Goal process. Uh, we are still early days in terms of where that is, uh, but many people are, are, are saying if there isn't uh, a, a good way to, to incorporate and consistently approach the youth issue in the context of these second stage goals, then we will lo have lost a big opportunity in terms of uh, ensuring that that's part of the conversation and really emphasize in terms of policy approaches going forward. So that's another opportunity that I would encourage both of those in the audience to really think about, but even uh, from our standpoint, we are certainly cognizant of and uh, uh, will be watching. I think with that, I will turn it back over to Nicole for Q&A and, and your questions. Thank you, um, Steve, Zenat, and Andrew. We are going to have, I think, a great um, question and answer session from our audience, and you laid out a lot of um, really the, the critical issues as to why this is such an important issue for all of us. Um, it's such an important group to consider. And I think in your comments, it also really highlighted um, to me what I really heard in, from your comments is that link between the development issues, the diplomatic issues, and sort of the national security issues. And if you, we didn't get a chance to go into it in, in the introductions, but if you've had a chance to look at um, uh, the bios of really of all of us, quite frankly, in a little more depth, you'd see we, there's a little bit of a musical chairs um, among, uh, among the panel here. Um, I was formerly at USAID and before that at the State Department with Andrew as my colleague uh, before he was at the White House and Zinan uh, before her current role and happy anniversary. That was not planned, um, but a very happy we're all here to celebrate with you on that, uh, was uh, a colleague um, of, of Steve's and mine at USAID. So um, suffice to say, and Steve had a long and distinguished career on Capitol Hill uh, before coming back to USAID. So suffice to say, there's, as I said, you know, we've, we've played different roles. And so with that, you know, I'd be interested, um, you know, Andrew, for you to start and for all of you to comment on, as you've all moved forward in your agencies, where has been the coordination and what do you think are some of the opportunities and challenges in coordination within your own sort of agencies um, between sort of the different institutions of the U.S. government and, and how do you see that as, as an opportunity sort of moving forward to really harness the different um, resources of, of the USG to sort of advance youth? Thoughts? It's a big question. Um, a couple of quick things from, from a variety of perspectives. And one of the things that I left out that I think is important, and obviously everybody here probably knows some of the bizarreness with which the U.S. government functions in terms of where our resources sit, how interagency coordination works. Um, but one of the things that's always a fairly reliable driver of how we actually formulate agendas in this is as much as we're um, kind of intrigued by uh, and, and want to deal with these transnational issues, a lot of times our priority setting comes down to bilateral, regional questions, things where we've actually got something more concrete to be dealing with. And one of the interesting things that has helped actually <clears throat> put this a little higher on the agenda is not simply us looking at the demographics and saying, boy, this is really something we should deal with, or us looking at the global trends and saying, yikes, uh, we need to elevate youth. But it's actually uh, been in a lot of cases, particularly in the last three or four years, uh, it, other countries coming to us. And so if you think about the nexus of, of issues, certainly if you are, depends what region you're in, but you can look around the world right now and say, okay, I have a problem. Just from a very simple like maintenance of power standpoint, if I want to stay where I am, if I like the system as it is, I need my young people to have opportunity because I understand that when they don't, when there aren't productive outlets for their energies and talents, there are serious issues and not just issues that people blog about but people do stuff about. Uh, and so when you look at the nexus of those issues, it becomes things like education, innovation, um, economic growth and entrepreneurship and things. So to be honest with you, one of the, one of the places that people look is to the United States. And so We've got governments coming to us very frequently saying, this is something we really want your help on. Uh, and 
it also dovetails quite well with the President's pledge, certainly back in Cairo and since, to really focus on issues of mutual interest uh, with other countries, because this is a place where we align. And quite frankly, when you look at it from a domestic standpoint, we also benefit from this. When you look at statistics about who's founding new companies in Silicon Valley, it's strongly in our interest if you look at the administration's perspective on immigration, uh, getting the world's young, talented, best and brightest. And so those issues, this is a circuitous answer to your question, uh, but those issues have also come up in the bilateral context. And so when you talk about how, do these, how does the interagency process work and how do we see it from various angles, certainly there is a baseline of programming that goes on at agencies that we've turned more and more towards explicitly youth demographic. And I think through those lenses of things like education, and that ranges, and Steve can say this with much more authority than I, but ranges from primary education access and literacy all the way through vocational training, higher ed, preparing people for the workforce. Um, it also obviously has quite a lot to do with civilian security and a number of other issues. Um, so we have those things running as a baseline. What we also try and layer on top of that, and that's one of the places where I think when it comes to the White House trying to do this, we, we actually don't, much to people's surprise, hold the resources in the U.S. government. We hold a certain amount of interagency policy making, coordination, and authority. And so what we can layer on top of this is, one, trying to ensure that we have a, a coordinated approach to these issues, but also the bully pulpit of the presidency. And so that's part of the reason why we try to emphasize on these trips when the president goes out, talking to young people, not solely because the 400 people in that hall are going to make a difference in every issue everywhere in the world, but because we believe that the symbolism of that is important. And so that's where the White House can help to also elevate these issues. But realistically, getting back to your, to your question about how we sort of adjudicate the various priorities, certainly it helps when at a regional and a bilateral level, countries are coming to us saying, we need your help on this issue, we want your help on this issue, uh, and certainly makes it a lot easier for us to operate. So, and I'm sure from each of our own angles, we, we see it from a slightly different perspective. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I, so I would agree with that. There's there are mechanisms by which we do our diplomacy, and I think success for um, for me for an office like mine is to be able to integrate that into the places where um, those streams of work happen, which are our regional and functional bureaus. And so you heard me kind of talk about the institutionalization. I mean, I think that's not a glamorous piece of this, but that's a really important piece of this, which is that we want to change the way we're doing diplomacy to make sure that it's you know using all of our assets that we have in our diplomatic toolkit that takes change, you know, that takes time, uh, change over time because of the um, massiveness of the institution. And so I think, you know, we have a recognition that we want coherence internally within our, you know, youth engagement efforts so that it mirrors kind of the challenges that we're facing externally. Um, and I'd say, you know, when I'm in the field, oftentimes there is really great coherence between our, you know, our USAID mission and our embassy, particularly in countries where this is one of the priorities of our mission, you know, or this is one of the priorities of the country. And so um, it's both a top-down approach, you know, looking at the secretary's leadership and the president's leadership, and then it's a bottom-up approach, which is looking at the best practices that have happened in, you know, for us in places like Morocco, and I'm sure there are other places as well, to see where it's kind of also coming up that we can socialize um, and institutionalize that change. Um, so that's one thing, and then I think the other thing is that um, we have different stakeholders in within functional and regional bureaus, and some of my colleagues are actually here today who look at the programmatic aspect of this, who look at, you know, from a regional point of view, um, what does this mean? And we all coordinate, or at least we attempt to coordinate. So it's similar to this panel, you're looking, you know, at the places where um, you have somebody who can be somebody who's kind of pushing the bureaucracy um, forward. Yeah, I would just add uh, a few small things. I mean, I think one thing to, to sort of emphasize is that, you know, the, the idea of engaging with youth isn't a new one for the agency. Uh, I, I remember even, uh, you know, back in the early 2000s, working in the field, uh, engaging on unaccompanied minor programs where essentially you had youth who were uh, separated from their families due to the genocide in Rwanda who we were trying to reintegrate back in the communities who were living in transit centers uh, as far away as Congo Brazzaville. Uh, and so there was a real focus not only in ensuring that they had, uh, that they were formally reintegrated with some semblance of their prior existing communities, uh, but also to really target and focus programs directly on particular needs that they might have, both uh, as from the trauma side of things, 
to the educational vocational uh, opportunity side as well as sort of getting them to buy in once again uh, into political participation whether it was youth councils uh, as a stepping stone to, to more formalized uh, access so you know those type of efforts have been ongoing and part of the fabric uh, of USA for a long time uh, but what is different uh, and, and what has changed is that you know it, I we're attempting to make it more consistent uh, there, you know, for every situation like I described, there are many others where uh, I think the, the past history has been one of, of less of an understanding and awareness of how to actually approach uh, youth issues. So, you know, one of the jobs that we need to continue doing internally, certainly uh, at USAID, uh, is to really inculcate that understanding across a broader array of missions. And, you know, there are different ways uh, that we're considering doing that. Uh, you know, one. One aspect is is you really look to focus your efforts in a few missions where there's both uh, a, a sort of groundswell of understanding and, and commitment to the issue. You look to create sort of a model where you have good integration and mainstream with other things. You you have uh, the right type of engagement, and then you look to export that uh, to other missions uh, uh, as a showcase. That's that's one way to approach it. Um, more broadly, I would say the idea that we need to deepen and sustain our engagement. We need to build off the policy. Uh, we need to make sure that we have a, a locus of effort so that we can, uh, you know, take what Marianne is currently doing and have it so uh, more institutionalized uh, within the agency that it can extend beyond uh, the current administration uh, to whatever comes next. Uh, I think those are the, the challenges that we face. But uh, I, I think as a starting point, I mean, I was sort of taking stock of where we've come in terms of the youth issue. Uh, and looking at all the different ways that we're, we're attempting to engage, whether it's even looking at the, the, the President's Africa trip and some of the different initiatives associated with that, whether it's looking at uh, the broader outreach uh, that Andrew mentioned. Uh, and I really do think it's unprecedented. Uh, and I think it, it may have been born out of the experience, uh, you know, from the campaign and the election, but I think uh, it's much bigger than that now. Uh, it extends to demographics and the way we're really trying to grapple with the fundamental development issues that we view uh, of the day. Great. No, thanks, Steve. Just picking up on one of the points you've been talking about uh, in terms of the importance of um, integration and, and some of the policy integration, assuming that you've done it at, at USAID, you know, one issue that I've, I've noticed um, lately in particular um, within sort of the, the young people cohort is there seems to be, um, in the, sort of the global scale, um, some, some you know, separation almost between um, sort of youth agenda and advancing girls and young women. And I'm just, you know, curious, picking up on that point, on your point about sort of integration, mainstreaming, how do you see this sort of young youth, advancing youth issues and, and advancing um, girls and young women's issues? And, and how can we ensure that we're sort of doing them together and not um, in competition with each other? Um, so just sort of thoughts from, from all of your respective perches, if you will. Sure, maybe I'll yeah, start with a couple way, of comments yeah. and quickly pass to Zina. Um, so, you know, I, I think just as we look at, at gender issues, it's not only encompassing one side of the equation, only uh, relating to women and girls, but also uh, the behavior uh, and, uh, of males. Uh, you know, by the same token, you know, I don't think we can look at only at youth issues and only focus on youth and not think there's a broader ecosystem uh, in which they need to engage and which really uh, is part and parcel of, of how we ought to approach things. And so, you know, I, I think that there is a, a, well, certainly that there is a need to continue pressing that point. Um, and I think the more that we can break down silos, and I think that's as good for the gender issue overall, uh, that it's not even just youth, but it is across a, a, a host of boundaries. And I've had discussions internally about that. I think that's something that that people are, are taking seriously, uh, but you know I, I take uh, Nicole's point very well. I mean she's seen it, she's lived it, uh, and it'll take time. I think having, you know, the policy in place is a really important signal of the administrator's belief in the issue. I think continuing dialogue based off of that. I think continuing to work with the with the youth advocates and working group that are carrying on implementation, uh, having uh, building momentum from what Marianne is doing. Uh, is is going to be critical, but you know it's not a soft issue. It's one that we need to keep working on day by day. 
I think from my perspective, from uh, the state perspective, I think the uh, looking at uh, youth as a set of actors is more nascent than the women and girls issues. And so there's just been a lot more, I think, um, in terms of looking at women and girls, uh, it's been far more concrete around what the priorities are. So we've established gender-based violence, you know, um, women, peace and security, that women's economic empowerment is key, and that, you know, the, all of those things have metrics for success built on to the back end of those, you know, so what does the society look like if half the women are, or if half the population is not empowered what you know you can actually look at you know political positions and say this is how many women you have it's much harder to actually frankly to do that with youth issues I think youth issues do tend to be more diffuse um, but I think we have lessons important lessons that we can learn from women and girls and I think just practically speaking in the work that I do um, they do tend to be better coordinated, you know, particularly because I do a lot of girls things as well. And, and like you said, I mean, I think all stakeholders are important. It's not just looking, it's not that it's ever just looking at women and girls for the sake of women and girls, but all of the key, you know, key stakeholders in that process. Uh, no, it's a great point. And I think you bring up another challenge that I think we all face in this, um, advancing these issues is, is understanding is data and evidence and sort of understanding um, where young people are doing well, what we know, what we don't know, what works, what doesn't work. And I know that that's um, something that you all are, are looking at. So uh, one more question before we go to the audience, just to pick up again on something that you said, Zenot, um, which is, you know, when we talk about whether it's in the USAID policy or, or, or Andrew, you commented on this as well, the importance of consultation, participation, and I think there's, when we think about that in terms of advancing um, young people in our foreign policy, young people abroad in our foreign policy, and obviously looking at the, the audience here, it's important to think about what that means in terms of advancing participation and consultation with, and harnessing really the talents of, you know, young people here in the U.S. in our development and diplomatic work. So um, before we go to the audience, just if there's any other further thoughts. Um, from Steve, Andrew, on sort of, you know, how we're thinking about this, um, sort of engaging American young people in the work you do. Yeah, I can. Um, there are a couple pieces to that question. I'll start in reverse order. Obviously, American young people are a huge constituency for us. When you look at people who are actually, just by volume, the number of people who can participate in U.S. government programs versus the number of Americans who, on their own, are either connected virtually or traveling or doing service abroad, uh, the face of our country is often American citizens, and the face of our country to young people is even more frequently uh, American citizens. And so it's actually a huge problem that I think the U.S. government has is that quite frequently um, when a problem is presented, we tend to think that we are the solution to it. And so we look at what resources we have, what programs we have. And the reality is there are 300 million Americans who can take a lot of this forward extremely well. To the first part of the question about kind of making sure that there's some ground truth to what we do. Um, I actually think this is an area where there are serious issues because um, there's a temptation sitting in the United States to be on Twitter, to hear what a often very small percentage of a population is saying and say, okay, well, we know what the young people in that country are saying. And the truth is uh, it's a much more diverse demographic than the people who are on Twitter. Um, and so certainly for us, when you talk about consultation, when you talk about informing, uh, informing our policy with some reality of what's going on on the ground, we need to be very careful to not be swayed by um, what we're hearing. And I think, you know, again, the Arab Spring is a great example of this, where um, I think you look at a country like Egypt, where uh, I think a lot of people were swayed very early on by what was perceived to be a national movement, what was perceived to be a very deep commitment across a society. Uh, and not to say that it wasn't shared, but that coalition fractured re relatively quickly. And I think that when you look at the stories that the Western press in a lot of these places uh, sort of perpetuate, it's a sexy story right now to look at that sort of ultra empowered, often urban, very connected uh, elites and say, this is what young people are doing. It's a Twitter revolution, it's whatever. Uh, and so I think it's very incumbent upon us to to really try and get a little bit deeper than that to understand what we're doing. Um, the second piece of that, though, comes down to the real question, and this is a little bit 
related to your women and girls versus youth, and I won't comment on that one, but this reality that I think people think sometimes the U.S. government has either unlimited resources or we can do that and that, and <coughs> you guys all know we live in an era of austerity when we can't do everything, and those of you from uh, who are partners with the U.S. government recognize that there are real budgets attached to this and there are real choices that are made and, and there are costs and there are trade-offs. And so I think what we also need to recognize is how do we align ourselves, and this is an incredibly mundane and boring topic, but it's real. How do we align our people in the field to make sure that we're getting those realities? When you think about, especially look at the security concerns that we have in a number of embassies around the world. Well, if the only people you can talk to are the people who are willing to or able to walk into your embassy and go through a lot of security and be in the capital, and that's who you base what you know about the country on, um, you're going to have a skewed vision. And obviously, there are lots of means of, of figuring out what, what's going on all over the world. Um, but these are real questions, too, about how we array our diplomatic uh, resources, our development professionals, to actually understand what's going on in the world. It's not just kind of like, uh, you know, sorry to say it, a Financial Times poll. Uh, or commercial research or any of that stuff. And so that's a huge challenge moving forward too because it's very easy in the moments where the you know ticker on CNN is telling you that such and such is a youth revolution happening wherever that you want to think that's representative. And the truth is more times than not, it hasn't been. So To your point about the, the, the financial times, well, I will say one of the other interesting points is that um, for all of the opportunity, the, the same number of percentage of respondents commented that technology was also seen as driving, uh, the increasingly driving the gap, if you will, uh, between, if you will, almost the haves and the have not. So um, an, an interesting point. And, you know, Zena, um, you know, was a lot of leadership, obviously, on the, on the youth councils. And when I was at USAD, we, I mean, we worked together. Um, to ensure that in the field that we were leveraging the reach of USAID programming um, to engage um, a broad constituency, the broadest constituency as, as possible. Um, Steve, before we go to the audience, just want to see if you want to get a chance to comment, or Zena, if you had any further comment um, on, <laughs> on sort of engaging, you know, uh, American young people and, and how that's happening. Yeah, no, thanks, Nicole. I do, uh, actually. And, and I would sort of point to sort of three different things that sort of immediately popped to my mind in terms of both the development side, uh, engaging with youth in, in different fora. But I, I think number one, let's not overlook the Peace Corps, uh, a vast majority of whom, uh, you know, sort of post-college uh, engage for the first time in development work. Uh, I mean, I think that continues to be a legacy program uh, that that is a primary way that many uh, uh, people get their start when it comes to the development uh, overall, and if you know, you look at the background of people, whether in my office or overall in USAID, uh, many, many of them uh, got their first taste for development and, and have developed a lifelong passion for it out of that. So that's certainly one place that continues to be an important uh, aspect, institution to support. Uh, I think also uh, looking and seeing what we can do to deepen and in increase the number of uh, fellowships, uh, I know that's a priority. Uh, for the president, for the secretary, uh, certainly for, for the administrator, and, and uh, there are different uh, ideas underway in terms of how to do that. Uh, I myself am a beneficiary uh, of a fellowship that, through my university where I was able to go to uh, Africa, spend over a year in Rwanda looking and working directly on these issues, uh, and I certainly think the benefit of that can't be uh, overstated. Um, Finally, you know, there's a whole uh, series of partnerships uh, with universities that uh, the administrator really has made a focus uh, of our efforts as we move forward. One of them is the Higher Education Solutions Network, which really re represents a groundbreaking research partnership uh, with seven different initial uh, chosen universities on a range of issues from food security to conflict uh, across uh, both domestic uh, universities and even international uh, as far away as Macquarie University. Macquarie University in, uh, in Kampala. And, and there, I think, is, is another opportunity to open up, uh, you know, sort of the theory and the practice of development to a broader range uh, of, of people, both not only the professors and the academics, but their students as well, and really kind of give them exposure, often for the first time, on some of the key challenges that we're grappling with. 
I'm going to take a few questions. Why don't we take um, sort of three together? Um, we have some mics. If you raise your hand, questions. Uh, we'll go here in the front. Uh, Katie, do you have a mic? We'll go up here in the front. Hi, my name is Janine Cosson with Advocates for Youth. And thank you, Nicole, for convening this great panel. And thank you all for coming and speaking about your comments on youth and US foreign policy. Um, my question is really, a lot of times when people talk about youth and US foreign policy, the conversation doesn't really stray beyond kind of economic and political participation. Yet we know that in order to engage in the economy and political processes, young people have to be healthy. At the same time, we have a lot of legal and structural barriers that prevent young people, especially young women and LGBT youth, from accessing health information and services, especially around sexual and reproductive health and rights. And so I wonder if you could each speak about how your agencies are ensuring that sexual and reproductive health and rights of young people are integrated in the US foreign policy work that you all are doing. Thank you. Thanks. We'll take um, a couple more. Uh, let me go over here on the right. Hello. Hi, my name is Sherry Youssef. I have a question about how your various agencies on the development and the diplomacy side are reconciling um, these new governments, for lack of a better word, that were ushered in or triggered in by youth movements or youth participation that now no longer respect that youth participation and how are you continue to program in youth engagement programming or activities in light of those new government structures? Hi. Um, first, thank you all for speaking. Uh, as Zenon said, for all the youth in the room, role models are really important. Um, and you guys all definitely provided some great examples of that today. Um, and this question, probably not for everyone in this room, but I'm wondering if you guys could speak a little to youth um, that are coming up with more distrust in the government, worried about corruption in Washington, and how are we actually going to be able to implement all these great ideas and policies that these youth have um, in the current state of what's going on in Washington. Thanks. I'll, I'll take a crack at a couple of these and make sure I share the questions uh, equally. <laughs> um, actually, the one. Seems very generous. <laughs> Uh, the one question I, I wanted to start out, off with, actually, um, is the second question on, on sort of how do we engage with new governments, uh, especially those that are sort of closing space, even if youth movements initially led to a, a change overall. Uh, and my favorite answer to questions like that is to point to a new strategy or policy that we've launched. Uh, so two days ago, we launched a new democracy, human rights, and governance strategy. Uh, it, does speak very much to how we need to adjust our programming uh, to reflect uh, these critical issues that you're mentioning. Uh, focuses a lot on accountability, citizen accountability uh, and participation. Also looks at integrating democracy, human rights and governance programs uh, across our development spectrum. Uh, and then also has a standalone real focus on the human rights side as well. Um, but I think the underlying message behind that strategy, which is the first in 20 years update, on those sets of issues uh, is that there's a growing concern, uh, certainly internally, when it comes to closing space uh, for civil society worldwide. Uh, I don't have to point to specific countries. Uh, I think most of you are aware of, of uh, different places where this has been an issue, and it seems to be somewhat of a ripple effect. Uh, just as we look at sort of one set of countries, then another uh, sort of will join that. And I think we recognize that we're in a a bit of a struggle right now in terms of trying to make sure that these universal rights are things that across the board, both in terms of youth access and participation, but more broadly for society, uh, are things that how can we advance and prevent the rollbacks from taking place? Um, we don't have, you know, I, I don't think the solution, but we are doing everything we can. We're committed to it. We want to engage in dialogue. Uh, we want to push the issue, especially in those places where we feel uh, it's at risk, and as well as those places where there's opportunity, uh, and, and you know, keep, uh, keep the mantle going. But uh, it's, you're certainly touching upon an area that we're thinking a lot about. 
uh, and you know I can also make sure that for those of you who are interested that you're able to access uh, it's it's a publicly available strategy now uh, and and we'll be doing more on it uh, fairly soon and I'll turn over to see not or Andrew so I mean I think on that question Steve actually gave you a very good answer I don't have um, anything to add but um, I was I will address the third question which is around kind of corruption in Washington and you know and young people's voice and participation and, and um, last week I did a small kind of round table um, with some really successful young entrepreneurs from throughout the US who happened to be in DC for a weekend and just wanted to do kind of a you know a, a, a think session with them and uh, none of them independently would have thought of engaging the State Department. And, you know, the why in that is that there, there's not a value proposition for them in that. Like, we don't add value to what they're already doing very effectively around, you know, internationally. And so I think to get to, you know, why young people care, I think young people, as I said, have a global outlook. You know, I think young Americans do care about the rest of the world, whether they're going to commit time through the Peace Corps, independently through NGOs, spend time overseas, or see it as, you know, a business opportunity um, to be connected to their peers. And I think we have to make the case for, you know, the value we add is to facilitate those connections and that those have to be around issue areas, you know, whether it's around um, social issues or economic issues, but there's a, a lot of benefit, I think, and value from those connections. And I think that's a role that, that we can play to, to connect those. But, you know, I do think that apathy exists, but I think, you know, you like any relationship, you have to kind of prove your value. Over to you. I'm happy to take a, a very quick crack at all three um, in, in uh, order. The first on, on the health and LGBT question, because it's an important one and, and shouldn't be left out. Um, and, and Steve, I'm sure, can talk a lot more about this. Uh, you're probably right that when we get together to talk about these topics, we don't talk health as much as we should or could. Um, but we do, I think, actually, from the start on the LGBT question, make it very clear that part of what we see as young people having the rights they deserve within their societies are political and economic, but they're also extremely personal. Um, and so those have been important topics for us. You saw Secretary Clinton uh, come out uh, while she was still secretary uh, in terms of this being an important international issue and giving pretty much a landmark speech on this, trying to kind of uh, establish it as an international norm that people discuss. And so that's that's really obviously important to us. Um, the health question, though, is one where actually if you really look dollars-wise where we put our money where our, our mouth is, on all of these youth issues, we probably invested more in health than any of the rest of them. And so it, you're right, it probably doesn't get as much talk, uh, but it gets actually a lot more action than some of the rest of these. So, So I think that is front and center for us, even if it's not always discussed. Um, on, the, on the new government's point, I, I would direct you, I think the USAID strategy that, that came out really is a, is a landmark effort for the US government and I think grapples with these questions in a much more sort of detailed and sophisticated way than usually the, the public discourse allows. Um, but, but as Steve mentioned, this is a huge issue for us all over the world and I think as we see democratic transitions, as we see transitions, um, First of all, I think it's important to note that many of these transitions may have been sparked by youth, but they weren't fundamentally or exclusively driven by youth when it really came, when push came to shove. And so I don't know that, sadly, there has been the kind of tip that people, people see. But I think you hit on a couple points that are important to us. One is, uh, and this is, this is a broader point, uh, young people have been incredibly great at agitating and incredibly bad at translating that into any sort of positive, or not positive, but tangible, concrete agenda. Um, partially because of the organization questions, partially because of resource questions, and partially because, quite frankly, a lot of the people who are coming into power have a, have a deeper history of organization than you can have when you're 20 years old. Um, but this is a problem, too. It's, not, it's not, not exclusively on the governments, and people need to come together. And quite frankly, we're seeing local politics play out often much more than the struggle between, you know, democracy and, and autocracy. There are, there are local dynamics as well. But as Steve said, this is something that's at the top of our agenda. It's something that publicly and privately we're pushing with all governments, whether they're new or old, that we believe that you know, full democracy is not about 
simply having people go to the ballot box and, and drop a, a ballot in there and leave. It's about uh, the rights that come along with it. It's about the role that citizens play in society. But it's also about the role that uh, non-governmental organizations play. And when you talk about uh, young people, clearly there's stuff the U.S. government does. Clearly there's stuff that local governments do. But this whole civil society space must be vibrant and filled to prepare young people to play those roles, to uh, both teach them but allow them to play those roles within society. And so I think you've seen certainly uh, from across the U.S. government as those sorts of questions have been under threat uh, in various places around the world, both public and private statements uh, and, and increasingly you see from the Hill questions of, of re-examining where money goes and all that sort of stuff. So those, those are very real issues and I think we are very attuned to them. Uh, lastly, on the distrust point, um, I think that the reality is, and, and this is a place where American youth are sort of no different than uh, you name the country. They're, we get jazzed about elections, or sometimes we do, um, and then the governing part is kind of icky and confusing and seems weird, and so we go back to our lives and whatever we're doing. Um, obviously, there's a lot broken in Washington, but there's a lot that's really good. And I mean, if you look across this panel, this administration, and, and I think actually many others before it, value the energy of young people, value the talents of young people, and put them in positions that actually matter. And so I think, first of all, inside government, there are lots of ways in which young people can play a really important part. Outside government, there's just as, as big a role to play. And I think you see that even in the kind of dysfunction of Washington, when young people decide to come together to, to lift their voices up about something, things happen. I think about, it's probably a cliche example at this point, but like SOPA and PIPA, you know, like when everyone started freaking out on that, I've never seen Congress do anything so quickly <laughs> ever as they did on that. And so there's still a tremendous potential for young people. It's just a question of whether you feel uh, passionate about something and you want to speak up on it. I think part of the problem is that there's a little bit of an instant gratification culture, which is like if I don't see results in five minutes or tomorrow, then it's not really worth the time. And, and I think that's a place where our collective generation probably needs to figure out that the stuff takes a while. And so uh, there are more than enough avenues to have your voices heard um, if you can just try and be organized about it and, and be persistent about it. Um, some interesting data we can talk about after on uh, some of the mistrust and if we hear um, around the world from, from some of your, your counterparts. Um, we have time for one more round of questions, so we'll take um, three more. Oh, now lots of hands. Um, we'll go in the back. Thank you. Hi, my name is Anne Sophie Esperson. I work with Activista, it's a global youth changemaker community. Um, I want to hear your point of views on what issues youth can efficiently create change on. I think you pointed a little bit towards it, and what kind of support they need and what kind of support you can help them get, both in terms of diplomatic support, but also in terms of like leadership and safe spaces. Thank you. Great. Take uh, two more up here in the front. Thank you very much. This has one, been wonderful. Um, my name is Rachel Peterson. I'm with Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain. And I would really like to hear all of your opinions on how um, your various organizations can help um, our partner governments, um, governments that might not be implementing policies that we necessarily agree with, and help them to encourage um, listening to the youth and help them to encourage more youth involvement within their own countries. Thank you. Interest of gender equality. I'm just trying to get a question from a guy, but all right. Um, we're going to go uh, up there in the back, right there. Hi, I'm uh, Carrie Diener from Mercy Corps. Uh, thanks again for your great presentation today. Um, I had a question around one of the topics raised uh, related to metrics. And as an implementing agency, this is uh, extremely important for us, both in terms of how we think about program design, but you know, also I think in terms of prioritization. And I, I see that being a huge issue now in the tight fiscal environment here in Washington. 
Um, on that, on that uh, vein, you know, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what you see as some of the transformative uh, research questions for the field and what you think really could be game changing in terms of uh, metrics and, um, and just relate that back to how you, how you would um, see that playing out in, in terms of the role of implementers as well. Thanks. Great, great questions. Start on any of those? Okay. Um, I'll take those all, I guess. Why not? Um, first of all, on metrics, and I think this is where you will probably see the differentiation uh, among our various sort of perches within the US government of what would get people, first of all, what research questions are out there that kind of still need to be answered? Um, and second of all, what is compelling to US government people to kind of get momentum to move things. Um, first, on the research questions, obviously, there's, there's still so much out there that is vague, that is qualitative in nature. Um, I don't think we have a sense of what interventions actually work in a lot of these places, whether it's, you know, again, I think health might be a little bit more defined, uh, slightly more scientific, but um, when it comes to how we prepare young people to play a role in society, how we train them to get in, to take jobs, to create jobs, uh, those questions are still very vague, and you'd be surprised or not surprised that most of what we get in terms of research on these questions is kind of different angles and, and f a few little sort of creatively selected uh, tidbits of quantitative data. And so I think there's still a whole range of questions that's, that need to be answered. I think in terms of the things that we look at and would want to see more information on um, are really better correlations with things like economic growth and, and security. And again, I think as you go down the line, you'll hear different answers, but from, from where I sit, um, because we have lots of sort of correlations, right? We hear statistics all the time, okay, youth bulge, you know, and, 86% of the countries that have had civil wars or s conflict, they're whatever percent youth. I, don't, I may be getting the statistics wrong. That's fine, but that doesn't help us very much. Um, that simply reinforces something that we all sort of know. What we want to know more about are what are the, the mechanism, what are the causal links there um, that, we can, that we can actually uh, focus our attention on, mostly because, as I said before, our resources are finite. And I fear that a lot of times the U.S. government uh, kind of throws a lot of resources at a problem and recognizing that we don't have all the resources in the world, the more we can target that and say, you know what, these things don't work as well, and as great as they are, we'll let someone else do that and we're going to focus here. We, we'd like to be doing that. The research would and can help us to target that much more effectively. Um, very quickly on the what issues can youth influence, um, I, I don't think there's a, a defined set of, of issues. Um, I, I think, you know, when you look at everything from nuclear nonproliferation to uh, student loan forgiveness policy, I mean, the point is, if you've got enough people saying something and they've got a coordinated message, certainly in a lot of countries you're going to get attention uh, and hopefully some movement on policy. There are obviously countries where the correlation between public opinion and government action is not as close as, as one might want it to be. But I'm not sure that, uh, maybe you guys have a better answer, but I'm not sure that you could say, well, youth really can move this and not that. Um, I think obviously on topics that are close, more closely related to youth themselves, there's more kind of moral resonance to it, right? So uh, the right to be heard, the right to be educated, the right to have a job, those are things that youth can speak more authoritatively on than others who sort of study it academically, but I, I don't see there being a limit to the set of substantive issues. Um, then lastly, on the question of, of governments who are not um, not necessarily doing what we want, I mean, this is a, a very broad question, and, and I'll give you a somewhat broad answer, um, which is, yes, yeah, certainly there are governments around the world that don't uphold the values that we think uh, not only are best for global peace and security, but also best for citizens within those countries. And I think what we're able to do uh, is, is certainly say that. And I think 
you've heard in, a, in the case of a number of countries, um, us saying how strongly we feel about this. I think you've seen in places uh, in the region you work in, um, the support for national dialogue processes and making sure that they're robust national dialogue processes where all voices are heard. Um, and that's a place where both locally on the ground through our embassy and privately, and uh, it's not necessarily on the front page of the New York Times every day, we're working every day to ensure that in places like Bahrain, the national dialogue, or in Yemen, the national dialogue uh, is something that represents youth views as well uh, as all constituencies to have a voice in that. I think uh, that in addition to that, there are higher profile ways that we do and can get those uh, perspectives out there. In the, in the case of, again, the Middle East, when the president came out in May of 2011 and said, here are a set of universal principles uh, that will support both in the Middle East and, and more broadly. Those are principles we aim to stand by and, and principles that inform how we spend our resources, what sorts of organizations we work with out uh, in the field, and also what sorts of governments we will you know, work closely with and, and try to, to move in the right direction. Um, and so you know, a, a number of tools, but I think we, we haven't backed away <coughs> from the fact that we do aspire to a sort of core set of principles um, that we're going to continue to do all we can to uphold. Um, I think. So on the transformative research questions, I mean, I, I think I agree with Andrew, where I, I don't think that that, um, the leadership on that is not necessarily going to come from the State Department or from our diplomacy point of view in terms of what are the things that are working, but that is something that you know, we need to work with partners to figure out, frankly, with USAID as well, um, to see how is, to make the case for how is this moving the needle on our broader interests in a country or a region. Um, and so I think that's a very much ongoing conversation and, and something, you know, I think other multilaterals and international organizations are also thinking about. And so just kind of looking at the, at the data, I think we've done a lot to um, articulate the problem statement, you know, just as a community. And I think it's been less solutions based. And so that's where I'd like us to, you know, have these conversations is around the what, what is working and around just getting and socializing those best practices um, and, and evidence that backs that up. I think in terms of issues that youth can create change on, I mean, I can respond anecdotally to that from the experience that I've had kind of being in, in the field, engaging with young people. I think that any issue can, um, you know, that youth want to engage on, they can. But I think that the issues that I've seen kind of rise to the top have been um, around climate change, have been around um, youth as positive actors for peace building or, in, you know, or as positive actors for conflict resolution. Um, and I've actually seen that in a lot of different places. Uh, young people who are leading efforts against violence against young people. Um, and large movements to be able to protect, you know, frankly, children and other vulnerable populations. Um, and then, you know, young people who are extremely um, uh, committed to democracy building processes within, you know, their countries. So I've met a few people from South Sudan who are involved in constitution writing, similar to, to Libya. They want an active role in, you know, the way that their country is shaping up, which is incredibly exciting, but also around, like, let's say the elections in Kenya, you know, young people as, you know, forces for nonviolence, they're socializing good messages. So I think those are bigger buckets, and those are, you know, frankly, it's not, I don't, I didn't talk to everybody in every country, but those are the things that you cons consistently hear over and over, um, which makes you think that there are certain themes that resonate maybe more with young people. And then what we can offer, I mean, I think, Obviously, you know, platforms for um, exposure, safe spaces. So a lot of our youth councils are actually private. The names of the youth, youth council mem members are not shared. They're safe spaces. They're sometimes the only place where young people can engage in a dialogue. We don't lead that dialogue. They do. Um, and connections to networks. And so, you know, when you're looking at people who are trying to move from protester to, you know, um, actively engaged political participant, you know, we've connected them to other people in the United States who have led that sort of change and try to just make those, uh, facilitate those networks and those connections. Um, I think those are some of the most valuable things that we can, frankly, give to young change makers because we are not leading the change, right? They are, so. Yeah, no, I, I on that first question about issues youth can influence, I, I absolutely agree with what my colleagues have mentioned. Uh, you know, I, for me, the way I, I look upon it is almost 
uh, from a thematic perspective. So, you know, thinking about ways that you can affect norms and standards that are existing, especially when you have a situation of flux that's rapidly transitioning from a more traditional society to one, uh, one that's more modernized, but sort of grappling with all the issues uh, in the middle. So it's everything from, you know, the safety issue, gender issues, issues of tolerance, issues of diversity, um, uh, issues of human rights more broadly. And I think youth can play a critical bridging role. I think not only are they less tied to uh, and bound to the existing structures and hierarchies that uh, were formerly in place, but I think they have uh, an, an attitude uh, and an outlook uh, that can be useful to help foster the type of dialogue that we've talked about. You know, I, I, I really feel that it's, it's a cross-cutting thing. I don't think there's any one particular issue more than others that youth are in a good role to play. I think I, I would look at it more from uh, thematically and say how do, can youth affect and influence, influence this changing uh, norms and standards. Uh, and then, you know, from an uh, agency perspective, um, you know, uh, it's obviously, first and foremost, the, the, the locus of action is with youth themselves. But, you know, I think we can do a lot in terms of uh, the capacity building uh, side, the exchange side. Um, you know, I think oftentimes uh, youth, this is maybe their first or second time they've ever tried to organize. Maybe they're having difficulty engaging in a national dialogue. Maybe they, need, they have a network that needs expanding and, and they're struggling to, to connect to those who can actually help them implement an ambitious agenda. Uh, maybe they're suffering from a frustration uh, of impatience uh, and, you know, need uh, a, a larger group to, to brainstorm different solutions uh, in terms of moving the agenda forward. I think these are all things that, you know, we can either connect you to other groups that have been effective uh, in terms of undertaking those types of things. Uh, it, it's something where trainings, dialogue, talking, uh, as well. These are all different ways that I think we've uh, successfully uh, been able to engage there. Um, yeah, on the issue of, uh, with, with more difficult governments, I would reiterate what Andrew uh, mentioned. Uh, you know, often uh, in different places where we work, uh, we don't see eye to eye uh, uh, with, with the governments that are there. You know, one way that uh, we've traditionally uh, tried to deal with this issue uh, from a development standpoint is that uh, we don't always work just with governments. Uh, we work with a broad array of civil society and nonprofit actors. Um, you know, we uh, are certainly aren't exclusive in terms of those types of relationships. Uh, and I think, you know, as we struggle with this question uh, in certain places, that's the natural fallback for us to, to make sure that when it says, when we engage in a country, it doesn't mean engaging just with the government itself. It does mean engaging with a wider array of actors and those that we, we believe uh, we, we share more common values when it comes to some of these uh, difficult issues. Uh, and then finally on the uh, metrics and research questions, again, I would agree with what, uh, what Zena and Andrew said. Uh, there's a ton that we don't know. Uh, certainly even when we were dealing with the policy, there were part of the rationale for getting it out is that we need to begin to establish baselines, metrics, data, indicators, so that you know, as the next time we go around and, and uh, uh, launch a policy, we'll have much clearer quantitative answers to key questions that we're trying to figure out. You know, I would say in terms of where I think some of the gaps are, you know, I think there's a, a greater amount of data and understanding when it comes to some of the uh, earlier uh, sort of nutrition, health-related indicators. Uh, I think as you get to bigger questions in terms of uh, economic productivity, uh, and the types of activities that lead to particular impacts, that's where it really breaks down. I don't think the data has been collected in a systematic way so far. And so even as we talk about things uh, like youth employment programs, vocational training, I think we're still uh, in a mode right now where we're testing and trying out things, oftentimes anecdotally. I would also point to the peace and security side as well. Obviously a huge issue, whether it's looking at the child soldier issue on one end of the spectrum, uh, or broader uh, recruitment of, of, of youth in other conflicts. Uh, again, we just, there's a ton that we don't know, but as you know, we try to think through the stabilization, peace and security aspect to our work, uh, it, it, we absolutely need to get better data uh, and to think through more consistently the types of programs that can help us achieve those goals. So I would point to those as a few, but there's many more as well out there. Uh, it's a nascent field, and uh, uh, we have a lot to learn, to learn at this point. 
Great. Well, with that, we'll let that be the last word and be respectful to everyone's time. And just, again, say thank you. I mean, I think it's clear um, that with the, the leadership at this table and, and in the audience with all of you, um, that together we can continue to advance this agenda, which is still, still young and growing, um, but no less uh, critically important. So thank you all for being here today, and hopefully we will see you again um, in this space on dialoguing on these issues. So thank you all very, very much.